There's a newer reason that we're investigating insulin resistance. We're seeing some potential other ways that different foods that we're eating are impacting how our cells utilize fuel, or more importantly, how our cells don't utilize fuel. Now, obviously, we've looked at the world of high carbohydrate consumption, how that impacts insulin resistance. That's definitely a strong, valid player. Saturated fats have been looked at, definitely a strong, valid player. Overconsumption of foods in general, strong, valid player. But obviously, this is an issue that a lot of people deal with, so it's being investigated more. I'm going to read you a quote from a relatively new study published in PNAS that explains this hypothesis, but full disclaimer, it's gonna sound kinda like Greek, so the whole reason I'm saying it is so that I can unpack it in a slightly different way. The correlations between intramyocellular lipids, decreased fatty acid oxidation, and insulin resistance have led to the hypothesis that impaired fatty acid oxidation causes accumulation of lipotoxic intermediates that inhibit muscle insulin signaling. What does that really mean? What it means is that when we stop burning fat or oxidizing fat in the cell, we run into problems. So it's not just about the lack of being able to utilize glucose very well. We also run into an issue when fat oxidation stops. Now, here's where things get interesting, because what that study was ultimately referencing, it was coming back to a 2024 study that was published in Biological Chemistry. And this was a rodent model study, but it was really interesting. So what they did is they looked at three different kinds of fats, okay? They looked at a regular cis bond fat, so they looked at like oleic acid, they looked at steric acid, which is a type of saturated fat, actually a very good saturated fat. And they looked at something that was called 9-trans octadecanoic acid. Okay, that is a trans fat. And I can tell that you probably know where this is going. We already know trans fats are bad. Okay, so don't worry. This video isn't just to say, here's the new cause, it's trans fats. Come on, you know me, I'm deeper than that. But I do have to get this out of the way because this is really interesting. What they found in this 2024 study is that how these fats broke down was very, very different. You see, the first step in fat oxidation or beta oxidation is the breakdown of the fats by something that is called long chain acetyl coenzyme A dehydrogenase, here on known as LCAD. So LCAD starts to break down these fats, right? they found is that steric acid, like no uh, or andoleic acid, broke down really, really easily. But the trans fat did not efficiently get broken down by this enzyme, which led to this, and this is where we get interesting. This is where this is a potential cause of insulin resistance. It led to accumulation of components of that fat in the cell, in the cell membrane, leading to oxidative stress in the cell membrane, therefore leading to impaired insulin signaling. So basically, it created more gridlock. Part of the issue with metabolic health and insulin resistance is the inability to like use fuel substrates properly, namely glucose, anyway, right? So when we add this trans fat into the mix and it causes oxidative stress, it makes it so the cell is even worse at using that. So trans fats, not only could be a potential cause of insulin resistance, but more importantly, they are very bad for people that are dealing with insulin resistance because it's causing more stress to the cell in the first place. But now we go to the basics here, which is exactly what you're here for. There was a study published in Cell that described metabolic gridlock in the first place. Our cells reciprocally utilize or regulate which fuel they use at one time. They either use fats or they use carbs at one time. They don't use both at the exact same time. A healthy person has the ability to reciprocally regulate at a pretty swift rate. An unhealthy person might run into more of a problem. So in other words, when we do combine high amounts of fats and carbs together, it causes this potential gridlock where from an enzymatic level, we cannot break down fats and cannot break down carbs at the exact same time. This causes the accumulation of fuel in the cell to begin with. 
The biggest issue with insulin resistance and metabolic disease today is not sugar, this, that, and their other. It is about too much energy, energy abundance. And this can happen at a small scale too, each and every meal. Too much energy for the cell to handle. Energy toxicity, right? So if you deal with energy toxicity, you could deal with it at a smaller scale if your cell's already incapable of dealing with that energy in the first place. So a healthy person could feasibly eat lots of fats and carbs together and not have a problem. Whereas someone that is metabolically unhealthy might be able to only get away with a little bit, right? Where that number lands, we don't exactly know, but we do know that that leads to energy toxicity because you're combining too much of fats and carbs that the body can't simply use at one time. But where it gets really bad is when we combine trans fats and carbs at the same time in high amounts, especially in a caloric surplus. So this could feasibly cause a problem whether you're in a caloric deficit or not, but especially a problem when you're in a caloric surplus. The good news is there was a study published in the journal Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism that suggested that if you simply replace carbohydrates with protein with a given, in, within a given meal, you increase the fatty acid oxidation after that meal. What I'm saying, I know this sounds complicated, the lack of fatty acid oxidation, the lack of being able to oxidize fats, causes this additional gridlock. If your body can't utilize these fats, it causes more gridlock and makes the cell incapable of dealing with fuel even more, okay? So if you can allow for fatty ox acid oxidation to occur, you liberate your cells a little bit from this. So this study in Journal uh, Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism was fascinating because basically just replacing carbs with, fat, uh, with protein with one meal ended up increasing fatty acid oxidation the rest of the day after that meal. That's fascinating. That's why I typically suggest like have a protein shake with your meal, like replace your carbs, have a protein shake with it. Add the protein in because it, by matter of displacement, calorically, you can displace your carbs, but you can increase fatty acid oxidation. Recommended protein shake for me is Bomar Nutrition's protein shakes, hands down. Yes, this is a plug, but it's the only protein shake that I like to use these days. I mean, I use a lot of different ones, but I prefer this one because it tastes the dang best, like literal milkshake quality. There's one that there's their new double chocolate protein. They also have their strawberry milkshake flavor. If you make these with a little bit of milk or like that Fairlife milk that's extra creamy, it's, it is almost, in my opinion, like a McDonald's milkshake. Like it is so good. I never in my life have had a protein shake that feels like I'm just drinking a milkshake. They, I come from the world where I used to have to choke them down. So that's a 15% off discount link for anything you want from Bomar, not just their allulose sweetened protein shakes. So they're not using sucralose, they're not using artificial sweeteners, they're not using dyes, anything like that. I have helped them design their protein powders. So they came to me because I talked about them casually in a couple videos. I said, hey, what can we do to make them better? I said, A, get rid of artificial sweeteners. B, don't add weird emulsifiers and weird stuff. So they've been working and getting better and better and better. So it's probably one of the only like Thomas approved style, delicious protein shakes that's out there. So that link is down below. Check them out after this video. So add that protein shake, add the protein along with your lunch. And that's a huge game changer. But I have to be real here, okay? When we look at stuff like the Randall cycle, right? The ability to use fats and carbs or the inability to use fats and carbs together, we, we do have to look from somewhat of an evolutionary standpoint. So go back in time. Let's pretend that we're all living in, I don't know, 500 BC. Well, let's go further than that. Let's go like 5,000 BC. And we've got a little bit of uh, like structure, but we're basically living off the land and we're hunters and gatherers. I go out and I get a kill and I get a big moose and we bring it home. We have an abundance of protein and an abundance of fat. There's a very good chance that that's the only fuel that we have at that point in time. If we did have some carbohydrates, they might be some berries that even if we ate a whole cup or two of them, we'd be looking at like 20 or 30 carbs. We might find a beehive and get some honey, but that's probably unlikely. And if we did, it's like celebrated and it's rare. So when you look at all of this and you say, okay, well, when do we ever have fats and carbohydrates really combined in nature? It's pretty seldom. It probably didn't happen very often. 
it was probably majority protein fat or independently carbohydrates coming in. So with that, it helps us understand, well, okay, what's the ratio we should be having? Having 100 grams of carbs along with 50 grams of fat is not really natural. However, the way we live our lives today is not really natural. So that's why someone that is more of an extreme athlete that's moving a ton and lifting a ton, they are given more flexibility to probably consume these things because there is more of a demand, right? There's a demand to be able to utilize that and you have a, a system that's kind of on overdrive. But the more sedentary you get, the more that you probably should pay attention to like how our ancestors ate. There is some merit to that because I don't want the wrong message to get across that we should never com combine fats and carbs together. But you know, I did this video on like, what's the worst thing that you can eat in a caloric deficit? Like what's the worst meal, right? And it comes down to like most cheat meals that people have are going to be high amounts of fat and high amounts of carbs, or they're gonna go even worse and go hyper palatable, and they're gonna have a hyper palatable trans fat and refined carb which not only absorbs really fast and overloads potentially mitochondria, but you're also doing it when you're already at a lower basal metabolic rate. Remember, if you are going through fat loss or you're trying to lose weight, you are reducing your caloric intake, which means your metabolism is slowed down. That's the way that it works. So your metabolic rate slows down as you decrease your caloric intake, and then wha-bam, you have a bunch of calories, already a problem, but you also have a bunch of fats, possibly trans fats, and carbs combined, and the cells say, wait a minute, we don't know what to do with this. So A, it doesn't use them properly, and you possibly store, B, it could potentially impairs your insulin signaling, and C, it drives up stress from fuel accumulation and particles in the cell, which leads to further problems long-term. So there's a long-term damage that can be done if you are combining these things in high amounts consistently over time, over time, over time. Is there a ton of evidence on this? No. Generally speaking, if you back it all up and you look at all the evidence, it just comes down to calories in, calories out. And anyone with a science-based brain knows that, yes, there's a lot of data there, so it's the safest thing to default to. But we also know that there has to be more going on. We just can't promise anything or make commitments or make claims because we don't know for sure. But what I like to do on this channel is open your eyes to possibilities, things that are coming out, things that are there, things that we're seeing in the research, and new hypotheses that are being challenged. This is something that I've stood behind for a long time. You may or may not agree with me and that's okay, but I do feel as though carbs and fats in combination in large amounts are probably not the best thing for most people, but especially not the best thing for people that are metabolically damaged or dealing with insulin resistance. As always, keep it locked here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.